on the House bill, uh, but just needs more time to work through it, both with other lawmakers in the Senate as well as with the House. But the dilemma here for senators is that uh, even as they decide to stay in session and continue these negotiations, there are a growing number who are having to either self-quarantine or have closed their offices due to the coronavirus. Senator Rick Scott of Florida is the latest to announce that he's going to be self-quarantining, was supposed to have a press conference, abruptly called it off when it was determined that he had come into contact with someone who has now been tested positive for the coronavirus. So uh, these negotiations are certainly fluid. Um, this is a sign that they do want to keep working, but I think everyone was surprised by the amount of pushback from Republicans to a bill the Democrats had hoped would sail through the House and perhaps even uh, receive bipartisan support in the Senate. Elon, stay right there. I'd like to make this a little bit more of a conversation with Fred. Um, you know, Fred, obviously, I don't like when people blame the political process and say we, we can't have the partisan wrangling. Look, these people represent passionate points of view among their constituents, and there's a strong difference of opinion about the best ways to solve this crisis. Is there common ground? What common ground do you see that could shape up quickly here uh, to get something of a, almost a trillion dollars in size passed? Well, I, I think the common ground is going to come when there's more of a realization of how much community spread there has been. Uh, we've got about 5,000 tests out there. Uh, the uh, South Koreans have done 100,000 tests. Uh, the British have done 25,000 tests. So it looks like we uh, don't have as much spread as different parts in Europe, but I think we are going to have it. And I think the more that it gets into the system, that it, it's not a question of whether or not uh, this is happening. It's really a question of how far is it going to go. And, um, and, and I think as soon as that becomes clearer and clearer, you're going to have a lot less bipartisan wrangling and a lot uh, more uh, coming to an agreement. Uh, and I think the president has to lead on this. He has to say, look, and not only do we have to act internationally in unison, we also have to act together in unison. And, 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 and he has to help the Republicans find their way to this agreement. Yeah. Uh, Ilana, is there any support, uh, as you can tell, for Moving forward with something like a coronavirus czar, putting Dr. Anthony Fauci in that position, you know, having a kind of a trusted, impartial person to become the voice of authority on this and let the rest of the country know how they should respond to outbreaks, you know, figure out, you know, literally spend 24 hours in a closed room and say, how is Senate, how is the Senate going to meet? How is the House going to meet? We, we can't afford not to have these discussions underway because of coronavirus. Uh, not in this particular bill, Kelly, but I will say that both Republicans and Democrats have acknowledged that this is not a perfect bill. Uh, there's not everything that either side wants, and it's certainly not as much for Republicans as they would hope, um, but that they will have to take several bites of the apple. So right now what they're focused on is perhaps using the framework of the House bill, uh, which does not include a coronavirus czar, as a starting point, try to get this passed, and then perhaps come back with something else. One of the sticking points in the bill right now is how to structure paid sick leave. So everyone agrees we should have sick leave for people who have to stay home because they've been infected or um, have somehow been having to quarantine because of the outbreak. But do you do that through the Social Security Administration? Do you do that through some other separate structure? How long should the sick leave last? How much should it be? These are the details that are now bogging down the discussion, and we'll see if they can get them resolved. Yeah, I, I want to take more of the Mark Cuban approach. He says, I'm going to take care of the people who work here. We'll figure out the details later, but I'm going to take care of it. Uh, thank you both. Elon Moy, Fred Kemp, appreciate it this afternoon. want to move on and talk about the airlines. They are getting crushed after the president's unprecedented European travel ban announcement. A Southwest is down about 12% today. United and Delta, which would be more directly affected, are both down about 15%. And EU leaders are slamming the ban, saying the president acted unilaterally and without their consultation. The U.S. Travel Association also speaking out against it, saying in a statement, quote, temporarily shutting off travel from Europe is going to exacerbate the already heavy impact of coronavirus on the travel industry and the 15.7 million Americans whose jobs depend on it. My next guest says the outbreak could serve as a liquidity stress test for the airlines, and it seems as though we're experiencing that now. Brandon Oglinski rejoins me. He's an airline analyst at Barclays. Brandon, who, you know, the, if this is a liquidity stress test, you know, it's not a big vote of confidence by the market. Uh, yeah, look, we, um, and Kelly, by the way, thanks for having us on. I mean, there's, uh, you know, 
trying to put some stability in the markets here. Uh, but, you know, for airlines right now, and just given how much they're trading down, people are really worried about liquidity. No one knows how bad travel is going to get. We just heard this week that bookings are down 25 to 30 percent on a gross basis. That's from United and Delta. Uh, but on a net basis, that's net of, uh, you know, refunds. They're actually down about 75 percent in the U.S. And they were down 100 percent in the Pacific and the Atlantic. So at this point, we're really stressing our models here. We took revenue down 80 percent in 2Q. We assume that all the advanced ticket purchases actually go away, so they have to fund working capital. What we find is that, you know, American probably needs another 2 to $3 billion of capital. We think Delta needs about $2. Uh, United did raise $2 billion earlier this week. Mm-hmm. I suspect we're going to see all the big carriers, especially those with more corporate-exposed bookings, uh, needing to raise capital probably in the next few days, actually. Sure, and the 2 to $3 billion you described doesn't sound like it, it's, you know, that much of a, an amount given the numbers we're throwing around. Uh, in general for coronavirus. Do the other airlines... Well, I mean, you know, if you look at Delta, they have an investment-grade balance sheet. I think all the major carriers have a revolver of some sort uh, that, you know, they can obviously draw down that is uh, included in their current liquidity picture. You know, it's important to note, United came out on, uh, I think, Monday or Tuesday. Their next CEO, Scott Kirby, said, look, we've modeled... Uh, you know, a pretty draconian scenario with revenue down 60 to 70 percent this quarter, you know, tapering off to about down 30 percent in the fourth quarter, which would be really unprecedented. You know, keep in mind, uh, September 11th, revenue went down 20 percent for the industry. So this would be a really big test. Uh, But they said even in that scenario with the capital they've raised, they believe they can be cash positive by three billion throughout the whole course of that type of contraction. So I think it's really prudent for the boards and the management teams right now to be looking at cash. What sources of capital do we have? And unfortunately, you know, for American, they've obviously pursued a more aggressive strategy in the last few years, repurchasing a lot more stock, taking on a lot more debt. Yep. Um, so that's where I think we see the most concerns. But, you know, then again, look, Barclays and Citigroup have a big credit card relationship with them. It wouldn't shock me if we saw a few billion dollars of forward miles purchased from these banks. You know, they also have term facilities that we think they could actually stretch out. So there's lots of options on the table here. CapEx is going to get pushed out. You know, everyone's going to feel this throughout, uh, you know, the aerospace system, too. So deliveries won't happen. But I don't think any of these companies are actually going to go bankrupt uh, through this crisis. Well, the fact that you have to say that tells us just how bad it is out there. But, Brandon, we appreciate it. Like you said, liquidity stress test for all these companies. And American may be the poster child for uh, investors being upset about those debt-funded buybacks. We'll leave it there, Brandon. We'll check back in with you soon. Brandon Aglinski of Barclays. And from the air to the sea now, this pandemic has been devastating the cruise industry too. Princes and Viking Cruises today suspending global ship operations. For more, let's get to Seema Modi. Seema. Kelly, that's right. Carnival announcing its halting operations of the Princess Cruise Line. 18 ships in total for about two months. This will impact sailing scheduled from March 12th to May 10th. And it follows two high-profile quarantines, the Diamond Princess off the coast of Japan and the Grand Princess off the coast of California over growing coronavirus concerns. The Princess line accounts for roughly 20% of Carnival's EBITDA. Uh, According to analysts at Instanet, the stock, Carnival, down about 17% today. Experts say they wouldn't be surprised to see other cruise lines follow Princess's decision. In fact, Viking, an operator of luxury river cruises, backed by private equity from TPG and the Canadian Pension Fund, suspending all sailings till May 1st. This is, of course, a private company, but you're starting to see the fallout spread as well, Kelly. It's not just the cruise lines. You take a look at the hotel operators, uh, the online travel names like Booking Holdings and Expedia, all seeing significant losses in today's trade. I I don't know if we can show the year-to-date declines for these cruise uh, operators, Seema, but Norwegian's now trading at $11 a share. Yeah, that stock is... uh, been hit really hard, not just today, but Norwegian suffering the most. If you look at the year-to-date performance of Royal Caribbean, Carnival, and Norwegian, the three publicly listed cruise operators. Norwegian's uh, down 80 percent. Yeah. Year-to-date, exactly. And following that, you'll see Royal down, I think, about 70 percent. Carnival, actually, interestingly enough, despite the high profile uh, and negative attention that it's received with the Princess Line, it's uh, faring better on a year-to-date basis. All right. Seema, thank you. We appreciate yeah. it. Seema Modi, it's been a wild session here on Wall Street. The S&P circuit breaker kicked in for the second time this week that halted halted trading for 15 minutes. That was shortly after the open this morning. The Dow was down 2,200 points at the lows. It went up uh, to a decline of about 750 after the Federal Reserve came in just before the turn of the hour with an emergency liquidity announcement. Uh, But we've slid back down now. The Dow's down 1,800 points. It's a 7.6 percent drop. The Russell 2000 small caps are down more than 9 percent today. The 10-year yield, which again, as of yesterday, was kind 
kind of uncoupling with these markets and had moved higher, is uh, standing about 71 basis points right now in the wake of all of this. So it's kind of chopping around. Crude oil has been crushing, uh, crushed again, I should say. Uh, big declines across Brent and WTI. Uh, there's WTI down 6%. It's just under $31 a barrel. The industrial ETF is on pace for its worst week since uh, September of 2001, with more than 11 members down 10% or more today. That includes United Airlines, Boeing, General Electric, UTX, Delta, and American Airlines. Fast-moving news here. United's down 18%. Let's get to Sue Herrera for a news update at this moment. Sue? And there's a lot going on at this point, Kelly. Just moments ago, the announcement came that Sunday's Democratic presidential debate is being moved from Phoenix to Washington, D.C. The organizers are making the chance to reduce the coronavirus risk because Univision's moderator, Jorge Ramos, is pulling out of that debate because he was recently in contact with someone who tested positive for the coronavirus. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is self-isolating after his wife Sophie began showing flu-like symptoms following a trip to Britain. The couple are staying at home pending the results of her test for the coronavirus. National Guard troops a short while ago began handing out supplies in New Rochelle, New York. There's currently a one-mile containment zone in an effort to curb the coronavirus outbreak. New York's governor calls the area the most significant cluster in the country. The containment zone is set to continue through March 25th. And Major League Soccer has suspended all games for the next 30 days because of the coronavirus. The uh, league says it will continue to monitor events as it works on plans to try and resume the season. Just one of the latest sports teams and leagues to announce that they are either canceling or suspending because of the virus. Kelly, back to you. Yeah, their headlines are coming in Fast and Furious. Sue, thank you. And the Fast and Furious movie's now been suspended a year. Anyway, as Sue mentioned, the world of sports is coming to grips with a new reality during this pandemic. Let's bring in Eric Chemi with all the cancellations and suspensions up to this point. Eric, the, just the last few minutes, we're hearing from the Major League Baseball and National Hockey League. Yeah, that's right. So the NBA, they took the lead last night. That was followed by a host of other sports entities today. Major League Soccer, ATP Tennis, college sports, and so on. They've all announced cancellations or postponements to their seasons. We've been getting a new one basically every few minutes in this past hour. These sports industries, they're massive businesses. Consider just the NBA. It brings $9 billion in league-wide revenues every year. $4 billion gets paid to the players. $3 billion comes just from its national TV rights deal with ESPN and Turner. You add in the PGA, which will have tournaments still, but without fans. Major League Soccer, they're now suspended. ATP tennis tour that's suspended that's billions of dollars more and then just in the last few minutes we're hearing that the major league baseball that spring training is now being suspended and national hockey league they are suspended those those two alone that's combined 16 billion dollars a year and all the major conference basketball tournaments they were canceled today one game was canceled at halftime just about a few minutes ago but the one big thing we're waiting for that ncaa march madness tournament they have still not cancel that tournament. They make a billion dollars a year just from those three weekends. Yeah, and now so we'll have ripple on. effects back to the schools. Eric, hold that thought and stick around because the growing list of leagues suspending games or banning fans is likely to have a huge financial impact. And our next guest says there's not even a way to quantify it right now. There's no precedent. There's no playbook for this situation. George Pine is here. He's the founder and CEO of Bruin Sports Capital. It's great to have you, George. I mean, what is business like on a day like this? It's tough right now, and it's unknown. I think in the long run, it will sort itself out over a long period of time, but in the short run, it's going to be very choppy. And the places to look first, as, as Eric mentioned, the NCAA, the NBA playoffs, the NHL playoffs, the, uh, sports that are in the playoff run, that's where the money's made. That's the most profitable time of the year. So those sports are in the toughest position. Things like Major League uh, Baseball, they can delay the season. They can add double headers. They can extend the season. But those sports that are in the playoff front, it's going to be difficult. Lastly, the local uh, people in the communities. Sure. Restaurants, bars, people to collect tickets, security. Those people are going to be hit hard, too. So it's a very difficult situation. And at least the NBA has major TV contracts. Hockey, as I understand it, I mean, they're making money from primarily who's in those seats. So, so losing this era could be a revenue huge revenue matters blow. more relatively to hockey than it does the NBA. March Madness, it's more about the TV revenue. But what's interesting to me is you notice the difference between indoor sports and outdoor sports. Obviously, George was an executive at NASCAR. So NASCAR and golf, they're going to still keep going just mm. without fans. Those are played outside. So maybe they think, okay, you're not trapped inside. So we'll see if they change their tune right, in the next couple of weeks. Think about, we, I was talking to an NBA team president today. 
It's three to five million in gross revenue per event. So if you have ten events a night, that's thirty to fifty million. And there's about doing three, ten home games left for teams. Right, right. and then you yeah. play three games a week. That's you know two hundred million dollars out the window on one sport. Then you put in the NHL and these other games. It's a meaningful impact locally. What about the NBA players themselves? So both for NHL and NBA, this will have repercussions on their salaries for next year, won't it? It will have some impact, but I think the, the, the players, the TV networks, the leagues on the, on the media side, that will get worked out. I mean, if you have a $24 billion deal, you'll figure out a couple hundred million. It's the local market, the local teams, and the people locally – they're going to get hit the hardest. Do you guys hear anything from, you know, a lot of stadiums have now been financed by municipal debt, and I just worry about if, if gate revenues there are down. And I know they typically would have offsets, but not if you're not having large gatherings of any kind right now. You know, there's, I, I just wonder about kind of the ripple effects throughout the stadium financing market. I think for a couple of months, I think you, you probably work your way through it. If this is prolonged, 12, 18 months, that would be different. But I think over three or four months, you probably get your way through. What about... We know. I know your kids are college athletes, one in high school about to be a college athlete. How are they dealing with this? Because you're seeing the Ivy League canceled all sports. A lot of these college football programs are starting to shut down. How are you just dealing with your it's own It's tough. You know, the, I kids? went to Brown. Brown beat the national champion Virginia lacrosse team. My best friend's dad, uh, son, is the captain of the team. All of a sudden he gets a note. He worked all year to play on this team, and they're not going to play ever again. Right. It's his senior year. So I think what if you're a, a junior in high school who's being recruited and you have no season? I mean, I don't understand. It, it yeah. These things have real consequences. So, you know, having run a league before, you have to look at it from all aspects. The competitor, the state, the local government, your TV partner, sponsors, the health of your employees, the health of the players. It's a whole bunch of inputs, and you got to weigh them and make the best decision so, you can. And as you guys have said, the, the, the major kind of outlier right now is March Madness. There is so much at stake here for whether they cancel. As of right now, they're going to play it, but with no, no one in the stadiums. Is Which that is right? what a lot of the conference tournaments said a day or two ago. Exactly. And then all of a sudden today it was, okay, forget it. We're not even going to play empty. And, and it's a money thing because when you think about it logically, they have a TV contract for 2032. So, yes, it's $900 million in TV revenue. But over that length of a deal, I'm sure you can figure it out. So it's balancing the desire to collect the $900 million versus the other other issues. And I guess it depends on where those losses are going to come down. Who who would bear the losses, and is there insurance for anything like this? Well, I just think you could work it out over the course of your TV deal in the worst-case scenario, but people that are going to get hurt, all those facilities that are going to host the games, those companies that did the ticketing and hospitality packages, how does it work with the sponsors? I think it's less of an issue, really, for the NCAA and more of an issue for the people that live didn't, in the didn't, e- e- ecosystem. Didn't one of your investment companies have something to do with Mercedes-Benz they in did. Atlanta, and that's where the Final Four was going to be, I think, this year, right? And it's like, oh, maybe maybe we need to go to a smaller venue. We right. don't need a football stadium if no one's coming. Anybody who's involved in the event business is going to take a hit. The question is, is it how, how pronounced is it long-term versus short-term? I just think it's the short-term hits, and really the working person is really going to get... You know, who's the, the security people, the ticketing Absolutely. people, the food service people, all those local small businesses? This is real revenue to them, and it's not going to be there. Yeah. Guys, thanks. Uh, George Pine, we appreciate you coming down today. Our own Eric Chemi as well. Uh, let's take a look at the markets right now, because we are headed back towards session lows. The Dow's down 1,800 points, or nearly 8% right now. Remember, after we triggered the 7% circuit breaker the first time, it has to be a down 13% to trigger it a second time. Uh, the S&P is down 7%, the NASDAQ just shy of that level. The ITB is the home construction ETF. You might think it would do better with lower rates, but it's on pace for its worst day since the housing crisis. Down 11.5% right now. Our Diana Olick is in Washington with more. Diana? Kelly, several things weighing on the builders today. Mortgage rates fell to a record low last week, but are now moving up again as lenders try to deal with the onslaught of refinance demand. A pretty big jump, actually, yesterday for the 30-year fix. In addition, Bank of America downgraded Lennar, Toll Brothers, and NVR, saying that while they're still bullish on housing, quote, we would be remiss to assume no impact on end market demand from COVID-19. Toll Brothers in particular, a luxury builder, will be impacted by the massive drop in the stock market. It's already down 50 percent from its 52-week high. B of A is also tempering its forecasts for repair and remodeling. Demand and demographics are all very favorable for the builders, but there is concern that their labor force, which was already very tight, could be hit, and then possibly supply chain disruption for products coming from China. Kelly? Diana, the other question, which, you know, our Robert Frank has reported anecdotally, open house showings in Manhattan are falling because people are worried about gatherings. You know, my, my neighborhood ones were very busy this past weekend, but we know these things can change quickly. Any sign that the next few weekends it might be a little tougher out there? 
Yeah, we've been calling around to realtors all over the country. And as you know, all real estate is local. So while one agent in Texas said everything is great, an agent in L.A. said the same thing, obviously in Seattle you are not seeing that. Actually, in this area, you're seeing open houses being canceled. Also, Redfin recently said that they would be willing to do Skype tours of the house. That is the agent in the house and the person on the Skype so the agent could walk around and answer questions without the potential buyer actually being there. So it's going to be changing very quickly, and it will, of course, depend on where you are. All right, Diana, thank you. Diana Olick. Let's turn to the restaurant stocks today. Darden and Brinker International are down double digits over the past month, along with the sector. Today, we had Starbucks announcing it's considering several safety measures, including social distancing by limiting seating at its stores. Let's bring in Jim uh, Ballas now. He's managing director of strategic operations group at Capital Spring. That's a private investment firm focused on the restaurant industry. Uh, Jim, it's good to see you. So uh, restaurants, the trouble is, you know, if you don't take your trip to some country this year, you might take it next year. The restaurant losses, visits that are lost because of coronavirus, they're probably not going to get back, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's definitely going to be challenging for them. What you're seeing here is a clear migration from people dining in the restaurants to people using it very differently to off-premise. So you're seeing uh, people using drive throughs delivery is obviously picking up. So those businesses that have those available to them as revenue channels are performing a little bit better currently than those that have dine-in. Sure, and that reminds me of our last conversation about the ripple effects of these sports cancellations on a lot of the people who might have worked as security or in uh, um, concessions and so forth. You know, if people are ordering and off-prem, they're picking that food up, they're doing delivery, that's fine, but the wait staff, I mean, what happens to the wait staff if nobody's dining in, in these places? Yeah, I mean, it's it's very difficult for them, and obviously a lot of them, uh, you know, work paycheck, paycheck, and so they're much more challenged when the business suffers. The other problem that you have to remember is, you know, the restaurant business is one of the, I think it's the second or third largest employer in the country. And so any impact to the restaurant business and the employment of the restaurant business, you know, has ripple effects throughout the economy. Tell us how your business works. You finance some of the franchisers, is that right? Or with a lot of uh, different names that we know very well, Wendy's, Panera, and so forth. Sure. Yeah, we're, uh, we're a little bit unique. So we, we both provide equity and debt to restaurant companies. And in some situations, those are independent concepts. Um, and in other situations, those are franchisees of businesses and, and some franchisors as well. Uh, so we're a, a sort of a creative financing solution for the restaurant space. I can imagine your returns aren't going to be what you thought they were this year then. I mean, whether it's on the equity or the debt side. Now, maybe the long-term valuation shouldn't be changed, but there, are there going to be cash flow issues from these companies that just don't have the people coming in the door they thought they would? Fortunately, uh, most of our focus has been on the what we call the quick service or fast food space, and uh, those tend to be faring a little bit better uh, because they do have drive throughs are able to close the dining rooms and just have uh, drive through or delivery. And so because of that, you know, hopefully we'll fare a little bit better than others. You know, we got to talk about worst case scenarios now because you look at a country like Italy. And again, as Scott Gottlieb has said on our air, it's kind of too late for us to, to be like Korea. So now uh, Italy becomes one uh, possible path we go down where they've shut almost everything down except grocery stores and pharmacies. What would happen with some kind of business disruption like that in this country? Do you think they would ever shut down uh, restaurants or is there a way to make sure that they can stay open for people who rely on them, to your point, and make sure they're operating safely? You know, I would hope so. I mean, obviously, these are uncharted waters. Uh, we're in the early innings here. We don't know what's going to happen. Should we have a situation like Italy, we're going to have to deal with that when it actually occurs. But, you know, we don't believe they're going to shut down the restaurant business at this point. You know, in some ways, restaurant food is a little bit safer than what you make at home because we take so many precautions around safety and sanitation, whether it's cooked. Uh, temperatures, you know, just what the, the very specific policies that we have for our workers. And what for the business model? So now if I'm going to go and do pickup instead of uh, dine-in, if I'm going to try for delivery, what are some of the lasting changes you might anticipate here? Does it create different winners and losers? Do you think some of these behaviors might be sticky, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think what's going to happen is once eventually this hopefully will blow over, and we'll see people come back just like any other crisis, whether it's, you know, a hurricane or, you know, some other uh, catastrophe. And, you know, we see restaurants back, back, bounce back very strongly. Um, I think you're going to see, you know, you mentioned a couple of names earlier around Brinker and Darden. Those tend to be casual dining, you know, with, with servers and, you know, uh, restaurants with 
waiters and waitresses, those are going to suffer a little bit more unless they can migrate and do more off-premise. Absolutely. Um, I, so I was wondering, is if, if you're them, do you try, because that food often doesn't deliver well. Yeah, you're right. Are there menu changes they could make to kind of enhance and say, look, you know, you know our menu, you love it, we're going to offer such and such tweaks right now, so if you just want to come and pick that up, we're going to make sure that it's hot, we're going to make sure that it's, you know, it travels well, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I think already they've made those changes as the business in general, even pre-coronavirus. So we're seeing the, the businesses tailor their menus to what travels a little bit better. Um, obviously, you're, you're seeing a lot around packaging for safety reasons. You know, we're putting stickers on bags as they go out or, you know, we're uh, recommending to the vestments that we have. They, they take certain precautions or stickers over the boxes for pizza boxes to make sure they don't get tampered with. So you're going to see some actions around delivery, um, but certainly the menu items, too. Those that travel better, they're going to lean into those items. Yeah, chicken wings or something. I don't know at this <laughs> right. point. Jim, thanks very much. It's good to see you today. Thanks for having me on. Jim Ballas of Capital Spring. Let's take a look at some of the worst sectors in the market right now. It's not easy, uh, not hard to find them, I should say. They're energy, financials, and industrials. Energy's down more than 9%. The financials down about 8%. And industrials down about 7% today. The worst individual Dow performers are emblematic of this uh, to some extent. They include Dow Chemical, American Express, and IBM all down more than 10%. Uh, and all 30 Dow stocks are lower right now as the uh, index, as I said, is down about 7.5%. And as the scramble for cash intensifies, liquidity concerns are throwing the global bond markets into turmoil. The Fed announcing at the top of the hour they will begin a bond buying program. Let's bring in Ian Lingen. He's head of U.S. rate strategy at BMO Capital Markets. It's terrific to have you here. I, I you know... We just need the voice of authority about what is happening in the Treasury market and whether the Fed's announcement is going to solve that. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It is an exciting day in the Treasury market. The Fed is getting involved, but they're getting involved in a very subtle way. They were already buying $60 billion worth of Treasuries. They this were. is simply reallocating out of bills into coupons. Now, that's important because it does suggest that they're going to probably end up doing more very soon. Explain that for a second. So this is not necessarily new money into, let's say, the economy. It's not new quantitative easing. It's just a different kind. What does that tell you about what, why would they make a step like this? Well, they're worried about the market assuming that when this program ends, which it was scheduled to end relatively soon, that they're over and they're out of the market. And it's very clear that the, mar that the market and investors need the Fed to step up. They're going to cut rates to zero. They're going to do that next week. And they're probably going to announce another QE program at that point. Now, it, it, to me, the biggest question is cause and effect here. You know, we can go back to the emergency rate cut. I don't even know how many days ago. It was just last week, I think, last Tuesday morning. Markets have deteriorated significantly after that rate cut. Is the Fed creating this problem or solving it? Because some days I can't tell. Well, the Fed is doing everything that they can to buy time, because that's really the name of the game at this, at this point. The Fed wants corporations to have access to funding. They want the banks to have access to funding. They want to provide an opportunity for the primary dealers who had been disintermediated from making markets, and this is part of the liquidity issue that we're running up against right now. They want to make sure that that money is there and the market's going to keep functioning. Have they created the problem? Not at all. What they're doing is they're doing their utmost to make sure that it doesn't become anything like the financial crisis. Why did liquidity evaporate? Because to me, it, was, it looked like Fed cuts rates, it's not enough market panics, yields plunge. And when yields plunged, like last Sunday, below 10-year below 35 basis points, you heard a lot of talk about wide bid-ask spreads, about terrible liquidity. Is, is the level related to the lack of liquidity here? In other words, people just can't figure out the prices. Or is it because the central bank is tamping down any need to trade the market because they're effectively telling you it's going to zero. They're going to be, you know, cutting rates to zero and then bond buying. I would actually argue that it's a function of a lot of the regulatory changes that happened after the financial crisis. What's going on at this point is banks aren't willing to take the risk. It's not the absolute level of the move, but it was the severity. When you get a move that is that significant, people want to step away and they want to say, mm, I don't think I'm going to bid that because I don't want to be involved right now. Yeah, we spoke to Chris Repia in Power Lunch a couple days ago and he said he thinks the government bond markets are going to be fundamentally broken and he's a fixed income strategist guy. So this is, this is him, you know, panicking about his own future. I mean, to some extent, are these problems becoming existential? Uh, yes and no. Price action, when it exists as long as this has, becomes a problem unto itself. If this move had simply come and gone 
and it was the V shape that everyone was expecting. We wouldn't be worried about bank liquidity. We wouldn't be worried about some of these dislocations in the front end. And the fact of the matter is that people are selling longer term treasuries and parking money in cash. And that's why you see a lot of this counterintuitive price action. Yesterday was a great example. You had treasuries off, you had stocks off. That doesn't make any sense. Right. That was not the paradigm. We all talked about this in the afternoon. The treasury 10 year yield started to come back up, but stocks did not follow. And that tells you that something's broken. So what do you guys think is going on here? I think that we are very much in a panic mode. There's a premium being put on liquidity. If you look at the spreads between the on-the-run and off-the-run treasuries, that's very evident. That's a typical tell and something that we're going to continue following. There will be a point where there is a true sense of calm in the market. And hopefully that comes before the Fed. If not, then directly after it. Right. So last question here. Um, the markets looked better in the immediate aftermath of this cut than they do now. We're kind of back to the lows. Um, do the Treasury markets look better to you? Is, has, I know it's only been an hour, um, but do you think they're doing enough uh, here to really kind of help solve this challenge? Well, from my perspective, the Treasury market looks better because rates are and I'm expecting negative rates in the front end of the market. I think that will be a reality for the Treasury market a lot sooner than the uh, forwards are pricing in. All right, so to you, negative rates. This is a good sign. <laughs> to me, it looks like, you know, the apocalypse or something. Is that where we're headed on the 10-year, too? Uh, we're going to go right up against zero. Whether that's 25 or negative 5 remains to be seen. Ian, thanks for coming in. Thanks. We Great appreciate it. On a day like this, especially Ian Lingen from BMO Capital Markets. And that does it for the exchange today. Thanks so much for tuning in. I will see you over on Power Lunch. Here's Tyler. And Kelly, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I'm Tyler Matheson. We start today on Power Lunch with, of course, the massive market sell-off. The Dow Industrials off right now about 1,600 points, swinging wildly after the Federal Reserve stepped in to inject one and a half trillion, yes, you heard me right, one and a half trillion into the system. But virus fears around the globe are outweighing that relief for now. It is a yo-yo kind of day. Stay tuned. And just to put this all into context, the Dow is down about 16% or thereabouts this week. Let that sink in for just a moment. 16% just this week. And we're not even done. President Trump announcing a travel ban on all non-U.S. citizens coming in from Europe, but we're still awaiting details on a stimulus plan or a domestic response to ensure containment, mitigation, and increased testing capabilities right here in the U.S. And we're talking to two, no, three CEOs today. Group One Auto, Redfin, also Verizon CEO, about how these companies are dealing with the fallout and what the impact of this virus will be on the overall economy. Kelly? All right, Tyler, thanks. Let's get right to our reporters covering the story for us. Bob Bassani is watching another huge drop for stocks today. Rick Santelli is monitoring the action in the bond market after the Fed's big move. Eamon Javers is looking at the government response. And Meg Terrell bringing us the very latest on the coronavirus outbreak. Steve, uh, we start with, I should say we begin with Steve Leisman, who's on the phone with the latest on this move by the Fed. It's been about an hour, Steve, for markets to digest it. Yeah, and people are still trying to figure it all out here. It, it looks like what has happened is the Federal Reserve is going to do a series of massive operations to put, uh, you know, put it this way. It will be a trillion dollars a week of liquidity in the following ways. Let me go through this. A half a billion dollars uh, was done at 130 today. A half a bill, uh, that was a three month people operation. A half a billion dollars in a three month tomorrow. Half a and trillion. A half, half a month. trillion. It, it, it's, it, yeah, half a, half a, $500 billion each yes. one. Half a trillion. Sorry, that's a half a billion. I'm sorry. Uh, 500 billion. Um, uh, in each, three separate operations that will amount to, I'm told, a trillion dollars of new money a week. I think what the Fed's trying to do here is to just put infinity out there and just make available what the market needs. And the reason 
It says very specifically in its statement is because there have been unusual disruptions in treasury financing markets. Uh, spreads have blown out in ways, guys, that we haven't seen since 2008. In certain derivative markets, certain securities, they're actually wider than they were in It's just more concern out there. And the Federal Reserve hopes by doing these operations, it will provide as much money as is required for the smooth functioning of the markets. Will, whether that will be enough, I, I don't know. I've heard people complain that the real problem is the lack of balance sheet out there. And you saw that the uh, European Central Bank did something different today where it reduced the reserve requirements in certain areas. The business is not doing that yet. They may yet think about that. And just one other thing on this. This was done as part of a, a certain power that the Fed chairman has to, to take an operation like this. They say it's done in consultation with the FOMC, but not a decision made by the committee. Uh, apparently, there have been a series of, of calls between uh, John Williams, the head of the New York Fed, um, uh, and, and the Fed chairman and all kinds of staff, and, and the uh, New York desk, which does these sorts of things. Uh, they have been on the phone continuously for several days, I'm told. Um, and this is the result of that, those calls in an action taken by the chair uh, with instructions to the New York desk. So a very unusual operation and certainly a massive amount of it. Steve, can I ask you a question here? Because, And I think you answered it, but we have the, the operations of the Fed taking place today and then in two more tranches tomorrow. And then in the statement it says three-month and one-month repo operations for $500 billion will be offered on a weekly basis for the remainder of the monthly schedule. Does that mean that the Fed is going to be in the market buying at a rate of a trillion dollars a week? For as far as the eye can see, what does it mean? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I think you have it right there, Tyler. And, and I was on the phone with somebody in the bond market, and we were trying to total all this up, and we came up with a number of two and a half trillion, um, which I was afraid to say until you started doing that math right there. But you, you could do the math in a lot of different ways, but it is just an enormous amount of money. It is basically saying that if you need to do this operation of 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 uh, Rebuilding securities that there will be enough out there for you on offer from the Federal Reserve. Um, I don't know the extent that gets at the problem because we've had, you know, as you work like, I mean, the, the, the guest that Kelly just had on was extraordinary. We talked about panic in the bond market and, and some of the things that I'm hearing, which is the differentials between the futures market and the cash market are as wide as ever with potential impacts on the corporate bond market. So we're going to have to wait and see, but I don't think the Fed intends this to solve the problems of the economy. It's not intended to solve the problems of the virus or anything like that. It's intended to solve a specific issue such that wherever the bond market needs to go, it can get there with sufficient liquidity. Uh, and that was a problem. So it doesn't solve any of the overlying problems. Just mm -hmm. this one idea. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem in the, in the bond market and liquidity and the, and the mismatch of bid and ask that you pointed to right. earlier this week. Steve, we're going to leave it there. Uh, and we'll, I'm sure, be talking to you uh, throughout the rest of the day. Let's get to Bob Pisani now at the New York Stock Exchange on this wild day uh, where prices have certainly been yo-yoing. And that's a polite way of putting it. Uh, you know, Tyler, 23 years down here is the stocks correspondent, and I don't think I've ever seen the S&P move 6% in less than 15 minutes. I want to emphasize less than 15 minutes. Here's the Fed announcement right there, around 12.51 or so Eastern time. There we move up, so it's 23.50, uh, no, 25.06 to about 26.60. We're talking about 160 points. That's about a 6% jump. You're not going to see that. Uh, you can go many, many years without seeing that. And some stocks even went positive. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, typical market was down about 6%. Look at that, straight up. It actually went positive. You can see we're drifting lower here. Uh, by and large, uh, the, the, the trend is still intact here, and that is the global takedown of the market multiple. It doesn't really matter here. You're looking at 6 7 8% declines here. There's, even the defensive names are, are essentially down, consumer staples, along with uh, industrials. It doesn't really matter. Let's not quibble about a percentage point. Uh, or two. Where is the bottom? My old friend, Art Cashier from UBS, calling in, recuperating from an auto accident, sends his best wishes to everyone. He's watching right here. There's the December 24th, 2018 low. That number is 23. 
51. And that's an important number. Why? Because we're only 200 points away from that. Hey, we did that today, folks. And that, interestingly, is a 30% decline from high to low. Why is that interesting? Because that's your typical bear market decline for the S&P, 30%. In the great financial crisis, we had a 50% decline, but that is a big, big outlier. So look at that 23.51. By the way, a lot of people say, well, we weren't impressed with President Trump's speech last night. We weren't impressed with the Congress today, uh, not getting its act together. They weren't impressed with Christine Lagarde either. There you see the stock 600 closing at the lows for the day. Despite what they said, bond buying, market wanted a lot more, even from Europe. Guys, back